Então, uh, na primeira sessão, no primeiro dia, nós comprimimos muitos uh, elementos básicos do, do Python para depois podermos, no, no segundo dia, olhar para aquelas uh, bibliotecas mais, mais fundamentais que vocês de certeza vão precisar de usar para processar dados, que são o NumPy para, para operações numéricas, o Pandas para lidar com, com tabelas de, de dados heterogéneos e toda a parte dos gráficos do, do Matplotlib. Portanto, esses, esses primeiros dois dias foram focados mesmo naquelas, naquela núcleo do, de ferramentas e de elementos da linguagem que vocês de certeza vão ter de usar em, em quaisquer uh, problemas de processamento de dados. Mas depois, dependendo do, uh, do problema especificamente que vocês têm uh, de, de resolver, os dados que têm de lidar, vão provavelmente necessitar de outras bibliotecas para lidar com imagens, para descarregar coisas do serviços remotos na internet, assim, uh, para representar dados em mapas, coisas assim desse género. Não é fácil prever exatamente o que é que vão utilizar, mas vou aproveitar hoje para fazer duas coisas. Uma é para podermos ter um dia para consolidar o que aprenderam antes de acabar o curso, porque se, se acabamos a matéria mesmo no, no fim do curso, depois não há tempo para, para tirar dúvidas, exercitar e assim. E outra é para vos dar algumas ideias de ferramentas que têm disponíveis no Python para esse tipo de problemas mais específicos. Provavelmente a maior parte delas não será imediatamente útil para vocês, mas ficam pelo menos com a ideia de que existem essas coisas que depois é questão de seguir caminho por aí. Portanto, partem daqui com o conhecimento básico para poderem progredir. E então, nesta primeira sessão de manhã, eu vou mostrar alguns exemplos práticos de aplicação de Python para resolver este tipo de problemas de processamento de dados, que recorrem a certas bibliotecas ou técnicas mais específicas para lidar com a informação. Por exemplo, uh, extrair dados de documentos do Word, uh, percorrer sites ou, ou estáticos ou, ou páginas dinâmicas para tirar informação que esteja online, processar uh, ficheiros muito grandes que não conseguem carregar todos para a memória, uh, e imagens e assim por diante. Portanto, vou dar aqui alguns exemplos específicos, não, não vou focar muito nos detalhes, vou mostrar o código e assim, mas não é preciso estarem a ver passo a passo, porque não é para irem fazer agora exatamente isto. O, o, o objetivo principal é terem uma ideia do que é que podem fazer a partir daqui. Depois, à tarde, vou falar um pouco mais de algumas técnicas mais avançadas que Python podem ser úteis quando as coisas começam a complicar, portanto, alguns elementos da linguagem que não são essenciais para a generalidade dos problemas, mas que convém saberem que, que existe. Então vamos ver como é que nós podemos uh, processar documentos do Word. Isto uh, serve como exemplo para um, vários formatos diferentes, que às vezes parece que não são facilmente acessíveis, mas se nós nos formos informar acerca de como é que os ficheiros são guardados, podemos encontrar maneiras de, de aceder à informação. Este problema em particular era uh, para agregar propostas para temas de, de dissertação, até no, no Departamento de Física. As propostas eram enviadas por vários docentes em documentos do Word, em que preenchiam o título da proposta, um, um resumo e assim por diante. Mas depois isso vinha em anexo em vários documentos do Word e dava jeito de pôr tudo numa tabela uh, e organizar o, essa informação. <coughs> Uh, isto, basicamente, será o objetivo, criar um ficheiro de texto com este formato simples, onde tem o título, o, a descrição, o resumo, o que é que, é preciso que, o, o que, é que se propõe que o aluno uh, obtenha de, de, de capacidades e o que é que aprende e assim por diante. Agora, o, uma, a peça central aqui é que, apesar do DOCX ser um formato estranho para vocês abrirem com, com um editor de texto simples, não consegue perceber nada do que está lá, Uh, na verdade, é simplesmente um ficheiro zip comprimido que tem uma estrutura de pastas com vários ficheiros lá dentro. E esses ficheiros estão em formato XML, uh, que é, uh, é uma, enfim, uma, um formato genérico do qual o HTML também faz parte e que tem estas tags assim a especificar várias partes do, do texto. Portanto, lá existe um, uh, num documento do Word, o, o docx é um zip, uma das pastas que tem lá chama-se Word e tem este document.xml que é mesmo o texto, é a parte principal. Depois os outros são, são coisas como os estilos usados, a formatação, etc. Por isso, se nós abrirmos esse zip e formos buscar aquele document.xml, temos acesso ao que está ao corpo do, do, do texto, do, do documento. 
E podemos ver estas tags, w2.t, são as que uh, estão a ladear elementos de texto. Por exemplo, ali aquele, aquele T, uh, da tese, e depois temos tese menstrual. Portanto, este tem um, um estilo diferente, não sei bem porquê. Depois está ali a tese menstrual, depois tem ali física, etc. Por isso, nós podemos uh, extrair esse ficheiro do, do arquivo, do zip, e depois processá-lo. Para isso, vamos usar este módulo, zip file, que vocês têm com, entre as bibliotecas que estão instaladas aí pela Anaconda. Temos esta classe zip file que nos permite uh, extrair uh, ficheiros dentro de um arquivo zip. Então vamos abrir o docx como um zip e vamos abrir dentro deste este ficheiro. Portanto, este objeto do zip é como se fosse uma pasta em que nós podemos ir buscar os ficheiros que estão lá dentro. Portanto, sabemos que dentro de um docx tem de haver um document.xml na pasta Word. O docx é, um, é o ficheiro do Word que faz parte da, da estrutura. Então vamos ler esse ficheiro e vamos descodificá-lo para uma string. Uh, o ficheiro está, está guardado em binário, em, num, vem como um conjunto de bytes, quando nós podemos o read, mas podemos agora interpretá-lo como uma string em UTF-8 e temos aqui o texto todo do ficheiro, que será isto aqui, esta, é esta string que nós temos. E agora precisamos de extrair o, o texto mesmo do documento, portanto, tirar toda aquela informação extra de formatação, de tipos de letra, linguagem e assim. Então o que vamos fazer é partir por estas tags, uh, o, o WT, portanto vamos partir pela, pela tag final de cada bloco de texto, estas aqui, e agora vamos buscar para cada um desses fragmentos tudo o que está a partir do sinal de maior antes. Então vamos fazer isso, partimos estes todos e para cada um uh, do, vamos combinar todos estes fragmentos buscando o, o, que, o último pedaço que corresponde em partir cada um destes fragmentos pelo sinal de maior. Já agora, esta notação aqui é bastante prática para criar listas, eu vou, vou falar um bocadinho mais em detalhe com isto porque é, é, é mais poderoso até do que está aqui, mas basicamente sempre que queremos criar uma lista vazia e fazer um ciclo e acrescentar coisas à lista, podemos fazer isto esta, com esta notação mais resumida que é o que é que vamos pôr na lista e o ciclo que estamos a percorrer. Portanto, para cada x nestes fragmentos, vamos partir o x pelo sinal de maior, tirar o último pedaço que vem a seguir, Portanto, o fragmento é separado por esta tag final aqui. Se nós partimos tudo o que está aqui para trás com, por este sinal de maior e pegarmos no último pedaço, ficamos com o pedaço que é mesmo texto. E então podemos fazer isso aqui numa só linha. Para cada x nestes fragmentos, vamos parti-lo e pegar no último pedaço. E isto vai criar uma lista com todos estes uh, resultados. Ai. Vou mudar para inglês. <risos> uh, So now we can uh, join everything together in a single string. We have uh, a list with all these fragments here. Uh, so all these parts that are in black. And to join a list of strings into a single string, we can use the uh, reverse of split. So strings have the split method that allows us to break them apart, but they also have the join method. And the way to use the join method is you create a string with some separator, and then you join a list of strings. And this joins the list by gluing them together with the separator. If you don't want to separate them with anything, which is this case, the list can be an empty, the string can be an empty string. So we just glue everything together into one large string. So this function extracts the, the text from the, the docx file and uh, returns it as a single string. So now we have everything in a string. And now, when we do this, uh, for example, we get the text from this docx file and we get this string uh, with everything that is written there, the, the new lines and so on. And now we need to extract the field uh, that we want because we want to extract uh, the title of the proposal, which is written here, the summary, which is here, and so on. We want to extract this field from, from the document. So to do this, we need to uh, find out in this structure where are the fixed parts of the text. Because uh, the users are supposed to fill in these parts, but not change anything outside. So we know that we have here up to a maximum of 15 words, then the, the brackets close, and uh, the text follows, the, the text the user wrote. So we can use this uh, information to extract 
uh, what we want. But we can generalize this instead of implementing a specific function for this problem. It is best to think of uh, 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 what we would ha need if we wanted to extract some other part of the text or if the text was slightly different and so on. So to save work in the future, we can generalize and we can think about uh, creating a function that gets the field from, from the, uh, the text and the fields are defined by uh, a name of each field and then we specify what precedes and what follows the, that field so that we can find it in the text because it's something that is between, for example, words and the brackets closing and then problem abordar. So, uh, in this case, the title, there is these 15 words, the brackets close, and then problem abordar follows the title. So, the title must be between these two substrings. So, we can generalize this. Let's suppose that for whatever text that we want, we want to extract fields uh, by identifying what precedes and follows each block that we want to extract. And so, we define that as a, a dictionary of tuples. The key is the name of the field that we want to extract and the, the tuple that is associated is a pair of strings that comes before and after the block of text that we want to extract. So now we create a, a, a function that works like this. We give it the, the file where we want to extract information from and a, a dictionary with all the fields we want to extract. This function will use the previous one to get, to get the text from the docx file and then for each field here it will uh, uh, fetch the, the prefix and suffix of what we want so what, what precedes and follows the block of, te of text we want and then we'll split the text uh, using this, uh, uh, the preceding text get the, the second fragment so if we, if, we split, if we split all this text with this part here, 15 words then the first fragment will be the, the part preceding the text and the second fragment will be everything that follows so it will start with what we want, the title and this is uh, what we do here we split it on what precedes the, the part of interest and get the second fragment and now we split the second fragment with the text that follows the part we're interested in and get the first fragment that results from that so uh, basically what we're doing is we're splitting here ignoring this part and retaining the second fragment and then from the second fragment we split here and retain the first part and this way we get whatever is between the two uh, separated, the two delimiters and now we do this for the whole dictionary and we uh, create a new dictionary where we have the same key so the field name and associated the text that we extracted and this is what we get we can specify that the title is between these strings, the abstract is between these two, and the skills are between these two, and then we get the fields there and we uh, obtain this uh, dictionary, which has each of the, the items we want and the string uh, that is there in the document. So now we can just uh, create this to uh, save this to a file, so we get the, uh, the, uh, all the fields here, and we write this kind of uh, file with the, the title for the, the different items and each of the, of the text. So this is just exporting to a file. But basically the, uh, the, the actual details here are not very important. The things I would like to, to stress in this example is that even though it seems that it's not easy to access some files, if you know the format and, and uh, uh, how they work, you may be able to, to do this sort of thing. So, for example, the Excel files and Word files and so on are zip files with the XML files inside. So, it's possible to extract information uh, this way. Uh, another thing is that as you're building your program, it's useful to think about the future and how you can use your code in the future. So, try to generalize functions so that they are more uh, reusable and, and more flexible for, for whatever purpose you want. Now, another thing that is uh, common is uh, to, to have to obtain information from uh, some resource on the Internet. And sometimes the, the pages you need information from are not 
uh, specially uh, conceived to make it easy to extract the data. So this is where we may need to crawl uh, a, a website and get all the pages that we want and gather the information. So in this example, there is um, well, we uh, wanted to get uh, communications from the, the government. We, we have this uh, this site uh, from, that stores all the official communications from different uh, governments, and we have here uh, all the different ones in the in the first page. Uh, if we follow this link that says uh, Vermais, we can go into the page of each of the different uh, governments. And then uh, here there are some things, the prime minister, ministers, governments, the program, and so on. Uh, but there is this uh, communicado, the communications page, which is what was uh, of interest in, in this example. So the idea was to extract all the official communications from all the, the governments from this site. However, if you want to do it by hand, we have to start from the, uh, the, this archive page, choose each government, from, for each one choose the, the Comunicado uh, page, and then for each of these we have to click on each one to get to the page where is the actual text uh, of the, uh, that we want to extract. In addition, this page can have uh, many uh, results, so it, has, it is split into several pages, and we have this control here to go to page 2, page 3, and so on. So if, you, uh, if we want to do this by hand, and there are hundreds of, of items here, this would take a long time. But if we want to automate it, we have to automate the navigation through all these layers of pages in order to reach each of the items that we want. So I'm not going to, to detail the, the code too much. If you're interested, I, I can. So if you have this sort of problem, we can we can look at it into more detail. But the idea is that we're going to use this uh, uh, request to to get the data from from uh, uh, the site. We, you, you already saw some some examples of this. But we're also going to use this uh, beautiful soup class, which basically. Uh, uh, it makes it easier to deal with HTML files, to parse the HTML files and find the, the, the contents there. So we need different functions to deal with uh, these different problems. There are these vermais uh, um, links here that we need to extract from a page because we'll need to follow all of them. Uh, and we create a function that will uh, uh, receive a, a URL, so it gets the page from that URL, the page will be uh, this page here with all these vermais links, and uh, it will uh, parse the, the the page with beautiful soup. And now this uh, gives us an object that has under that understands the page, so to speak. So it parses all the page and has these methods. For example, we want to find all uh, a elements. A is the the anchor, the the link for for hyperlinking to other pages and so on, which with these attributes. So the class is this C all class. Because when we look at the, the source code here, we see that these links for, uh, for each government have this class, C all. So we want to extract from the page all the links with the C all class. And this tell, uh, gives us all the links. And now we check uh, if each of the, the link contains in the parent text, so the text that is associated with the link, this uh, term communicados, because we, we want only uh, communicados from, from the government. So we, uh, we also do the same thing for, for the, the page. Uh, you see here the, the, uh, these links have the paginator class, so we, when we want to extract the links to the different pages, uh, we need also to uh, extract those links. The same thing for for uh, the uh, the communications themselves because we have here when we have these links to the actual communication they have this main four color class because they have this this uh, different font with a different color and so uh, by looking at the HTML we figure out how in each uh, page we can identify the links that we want and then using the beautiful soup uh, object, we can easily find the different elements, the divs and the, and the links and so forth uh, for the different um, links. And now we can bring this all together to process the page. We get the initial uh, 
link that has all those vermais for the different governments, then we go uh, for each government page, we look for the, the link to the, the, the communication. We get all the different pages because we have many hits in those cases and they are split into different pages. Then we look through all the pages and get the communication and append everything into a list of tuples with the title and the body. So now we have this list of all the text that we can just uh, print out or uh, write to a file. So this would be the, the result. We have the title of each communication and then the communication and so on, and we can get everything structured in the file. So this is an example of how you can uh, uh, gather information from a more complex website. Basically, you need to look at how the, the pages are structured, figure out the, the path to get to each item that you want, and then loop everything and crawl the, the web page. There may be some uh, restrictions depending on the server that you are accessing because if you, if you submit too many requests within a certain period you may get blocked or temporarily banned or things like that. So you need to, to look at the server to see if there are some restrictions. But in general you can do these sort of things and, and uh, automate data retrieval from online sites. This, is, uh, this was an example where everything is static. So when you look at the page, you have every, all the information in the page or link, links to a new page and you can see everything there. In some cases, this can be a bit more complex. So this is another example uh, because uh, the HTML page does not contain all the information and is generated dynamically by linking to other sources where it gets some content. So this is an example of, of the, the programming grid for, for RTP2 uh, um, and uh, we need to figure out where the page is getting the information. So one thing you can do is you can use the, the developer tools uh, in the browser, so in this case this is for Chromium uh, and you can look at uh, the, when you load the page you can look at the internet activity, so the different connections that are being made and you can see where uh, your browser is connecting to to gather the information for the page. And here you can find that there is uh, this link to uh, the uh, RTP, uh, an RTP site uh, which has uh, this address here. So it, it has RTP, channel, page, list, read, TV, then th there is a date. And this is a link that the, uh, the page, when we, when we load the page, it will get data from this link. So we can check to see what is in this uh, uh, URL and if we follow the URL we see that there is a, 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 it's a, a text, a, a bit of text but it's a, a JSON record. So this is a, a serialization uh, standard by which you can store uh, information that is, uh, that is structured in a tree. So we have uh, items and sub-items and so on but you can store everything in a single string. And it basically looks like uh, the dictionaries that, that we use in, in Python and things like that. So you can actually convert that into the dictionary easily. So this is what we can do. If we want to get uh, the programming data for a particular day, we will not need to go to the actual site uh, and look at all the elements here. We can just uh, get the, the JSON data from uh, the link, which is where the site gets it from anyway. Uh, so we're going to do this. We are going to use um, this JSON model. So this uh, allows us to parse. This is a standard format, so we can parse this format into Python dictionaries. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get read the data from uh, from this site. Uh, so the text is the string that we get from the site. Uh, and we can use uh, load as this uh, uh, function from the JSON model that reads uh, a string in JSON format and gives us a, a dictionary with all the elements there. So now we can see that uh, in our data we have this result entry and the result has these three keys, morning, afternoon and evening. And if we ask for morning we get a list with date and the description and the, uh, the name of the, the program and so on. So this is all the information that we need. We can just write the code to, to parse that. So this would be the base URL. Following this we have the, the date for each day that we want to gather uh, programming. 
and now we uh, give it a list of days and for each of the, the days we get we format uh, this string and uh, if we don't have the file locally we download it from the, uh, the site and write. So this is also a new thing that is useful in the OS, the operating system module, there is this path, uh, so this library, there is a path module which has uh, many functions that are useful to check files in, uh, in uh, your folder, to list all the files and so on. This is file function returns true if the name that you give it is a file that exists. So you can use this to check if you already have the file. This is often useful when you want to download data from the internet because it, it may take a while and it may, there may be some problems. For example, you get part, uh, temporarily banned or there is some connection problem and you need to interrupt things. So it's useful that when you restart, you check which data you already have. So this only retrieves data from the server if there is no file with the, the name for this entry. So if this, you don't have the file for the programming in this day, you get it from the server. If you have it, then you skip and go to the next. This way it's easy to restart downloading if anything goes wrong. <coughs> so now we can build a table. This is basically uh, gathering all the data from all those different files, uh, reading it into the, the dictionary, and then creating a data frame with uh, the date, time, title, and URL for all the different programs. So this we can use Pandas to create this data frame, this table, and then save it as a CSV or something like that. So now we, we gather for all the days and different times, we have the, the, the title of the program and the, a link to the page for, for that program. Now, another problem. Uh, so far, we've seen that uh, for dealing with text files, we always do that read line, get all the, the list of strings, and then process the strings. This is very practical. It's uh, the easiest way of processing text files, but it assumes that you can fit the file into memory. If the file is very large, if you have a file with several gigabytes, for example, you may not want to put it every, uh, all at the same time in memory. And this is just an example uh, of that. There is this file here uh, downloaded from Twitter with Twitter data. It also has this uh, uh, JavaScript uh, object notation. So basically, this standard for serializing the, the information into strings. And each line of the file corresponds to a JSON record that has uh, the creation date of the tweet, the, the user ID, the text of the tweet, and so forth. <coughs> So, uh, so far, we, every time we dealt with text files, uh, for example, the dictionary of the residue methods, something like that, we use these read lines, put everything in memory, and then parse it. For a large file, we uh, cannot usually do this because then we'll occupy all the memory, or if it's more than the, the RAM that we have, we'll have problems. So what we need to do is read the file one line at a time, and then, or larger blocks, if you, if you need, you can read the several lines at a time, but the idea is the same. Uh, and in this case, since each line is a JSON record, we are going to use the JSON library and uh, extract the information that we want for each rest. So this is for regular expressions. I, I will see, uh, show you an example of that. But let's start with a simple um, problem, which is to count uh, the occurrences of different hashtags. So we want to list all the different hashtags and count how many times each of them occurred. So we're going to open the file as we did uh, so far, but we don't uh, use the read lines method. We don't want to load everything into memory. This gives us an object that has access to the file, and if it's a text file, we can use this object to iterate in a for loop. And what this means is that this object will produce one line at a time in this loop. So now we can just read one line at a time from the file, and it doesn't matter how large it is, we're only putting in memory one line at a time. So if the file is very large, this will take longer, but it doesn't uh, blow uh, up uh, our memory. Uh, if you have the file in your drive, there is no problem. 
Yes, but, but this is not for online. This is you are already you already have the file uh, in your uh, in your computer. If you want to do this online, then uh, this uh, this will not work this way because even the the request module you request the file and it gives you everything. So probably what you need to do is to actually instead of just getting the file, downloading it first and then doing this. Thing. But this is for a local file. So we uh, get access to the file. For each line in the file, we check if there is some text there because there are some separated lines that are uh, that only have a space or a new line character. And then we parse if the line has uh, this JSON record. We parse it, and we from the the entities we get the the hashtag. This is a list of the hashtags in that tree. And now for each tag, we get the text. Uh, to so this is the actual what follows the cardinal file, the, the actual hashtag, and we try to increase the count on our dictionary for that particular hashtag. So if the, the hashtag was already found, there is a, a, a number in the dictionary that is the number of times we found the hashtag, so in that case we increase that number by one. If the hashtag is not present in the dictionary, we get this key error. So we saw this in the in the example of the GDP with Germany. We didn't have it, so uh, it appeared with this error. So this is this happens if it's the first time we find the hash the hashtag, because in that case it's still not present in the dictionary. So if this is the first time we find the hashtag, we just put a one associated with that hashtag. So this way we get the dictionary where we count the occurrences of the different hashtags. We are only reading the file one line at a time, so it, this doesn't take too, too much memory. And then we close the file and we can return the dictionary with count. So we have, uh, this is um, for the, the presidential, uh, presidential elections in 2015. So we have things like uh, Presidenciais, uh, Blaine and so forth. Now another thing that we can do with when parsing text is to try to find things like uh, uh, specific expressions or or some more flexible uh, um, uh, expressions than just finding a fixed substring. So, for example, we want to find two words that are close together. They are not necessarily separated just by a space. They can have a number of words between them, but they are close together in the text. So let's say close together is they have one to six words between them. Uh, we can do this using regular expressions. I'm not going to go into much detail into regular expressions because this is actually a language of its own, but uh, it's a standard way of specifying patterns in text. So if you, want, if you need to do text mining and extract information from text, it's a good idea to look up regular expressions and see how they work. So this is a, a simple example. This slash b means a word boundary, a transition between something that is a word and something that is not a word. Then we can add some characters to, to match in our regular expression. This word one would be the first set of characters. Then we have here uh, this slash w, which is a, a, a character that is not a word, th that does not belong to words. So it's not uh, letters or numbers. Then you can have this uh, plus sign uh, tell the expression to match one or more uh, repetitions, and we can specify what kind of repetitions we have here. So we have uh, these uh, word characters followed by non-word characters, and these all have plus signs, so they can be one or more of these characters. And this is something that we don't want to capture in our pattern. We want to ignore it. It has to be part of the pattern, but we don't want to retrieve that. So we can put this uh, uh, question mark here. And then we have uh, the number of times this can occur between one and six. And these words are actual literal. So this, this is a bit complicated because the notation has lots of information, but this is to, get, to give you an idea that you can specify patterns in a very flexible way, with repetitions, with boundaries between words and non-words, with line changes and, and, and things like that. So uh, this regular expression gives you a very rich language to specify patterns in text. And you have this regular expression module in Python, that allows you to give uh, an expression like this and tell the module to find the patterns corresponding to what you specify. 
So let's see, uh, w we can create a function that will read from our file with all those tweets, uh, we'll re uh, extract those that match uh, this pattern, having this word and that word uh, and between them only a, uh, up to a specific number of words. So we need to have word one, then up to this between number of words, and then word two. So we're going to open the file, we're going to, to get each of the tweets from the, the JSON record, we get the text of the tweet, and now we uh, define this pattern. So this is, uh, we start with this uh, word boundary, then followed by the first word we want, then this pattern for, for skipping a number of words between zero and uh, the maximum, the between there, and then we have word two and another boundary. And now we use from the, the regular expression module that we imported at the beginning, we can use this search function to tell us uh, wh uh, where this pattern is found. So if this search function returns none, then it didn't find the pattern. If it returns a string, it found the pattern in, in different uh, positions. So if the return value from this search function is not none, it means that the pattern is present in the text, and we just include in our uh, matches uh, dictionary this text. So this uh, tweet identifier follow, uh, associated with the text. So now we can do things like, for example, Marcel presents uh, with at most 10 words between the two, and we get these uh, tweets that have Marcel and President following and at most 10 words between the two. And this is a, a very flexible way of extracting uh, data from, from text files. So if you need to, to process text files, it's a good idea to look up the documentation for regular expressions, experiment a bit with it, and then if you have very large text files, which is typical for this kind of information, you can just process one bit at a time, and uh, one part of the file at a time, and instead of putting everything in memory. Okay, another common problem is to uh, uh, deal with images. Sometimes you have to, to process images, and they can be in grayscale or in color. In any case, uh, images represent a, a matrix of, of pixels, so if you, if you amplify uh, the, the images uh, in general, there you can also store graphics in vector format, but usually these are not the ones that you're going to, to process. So you can think of uh, an image as a matrix with different values for the different pixels. If the, this is a grayscale image, then we just need one matrix and between 0 and 1. So typically 0 is black, 1 is white, and then you, all the, the values between are the scale of gray. If we have colored images, we need three matrices. One for red, one for green, and one for blue. And the result that we get is the mixture of these colors. <coughs> so uh, then when you save the image or you load the image from text, you get, uh, you use uh, different formats in order to basically uh, uh, occupy less uh, space, storage space with image. So uh, this is uh, important to have an idea of the different formats because when you're dealing with data and you store it as an image, for example, if you want, if you use JPEG, you lose information because the, the compression method degrades the image. So you should not use JPEG for, for actual data. PNG compresses but does not lose data. It, it does not have such a high rate of compression, but it's lossless. You, you get exactly the same image when you decompress. GIF uh, loses color information. It reduces everything to 256 colors. B, uh, bitmap has no compression, so it doesn't lose do anything, but it's actually very large. And then you have TIFFs and things like that, that there are other formats. So, in general, I would advise PNG if uh, your colors are not very important, because then you have only 256 values for each color, or TIFFs if you need to, to start to preserve the maximum information. But you can use a Python library for uh, loading and saving these formats. For example, Packet Image uh, allows you to do this. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to show how we can build uh, images in color. I can import uh, EM Save. This is for saving images in, in those formats from Packet Image. 
and with NumPy we can create matrices with numbers. So let's let's create a matrix with 500 by 500 uh, in uh, width and height and three layers. So this is a three-dimensional matrix. And now we're going to uh, fill in each uh, channel, so 0, 1, and 2, with uh, a value that is proportional to the distance between different columns. So I'm just going to skip the, the formula there, but the idea is that we're going to put on the first channel, which is red, uh, a value that is proportional to the distance to that corner. So here we have 0, then it starts increasing all the way to 1 here. We do the same thing for green, but starting from this color, uh, from this corner, zero all the way to one, and from, for blue, starting from that corner. So these are the three layers that we have in the image. But when we write the image with the layer superimposed, we get all the, the color mixtures of red, green, and blue. So this is actually how we can create different colors by uh, uh, changing the proportion of red, green, and blue in each pixel. So let's see a simple example. Uh, in Portugal, it, this is very convenient because the main uh, soccer clubs are red, green, and blue, and we can use them to, to illustrate uh, how to deal with images. So let's take one, uh, one picture like this, and now let's find out which are the red pixels in this image. So let's define a red pixel as one that has uh, more red than green and more red than blue in each position. So we can, we can do this computation. We, we read the image from uh, the PNG file. Now, depending on how the image is stored, you can have, for example, one byte for each color. So you have values from 0 to 256. But sometimes, in some tips, you can have, for example, two bytes for each color. So it can go up to 32,000 uh, for each uh, color value. In order so that we don't have to worry about that, we can use this function image as float from scikit image that converts the image, whatever format it is in, into floating point between 0 and 1. So we just have values between 0 and 1, regardless of what the input was. So all these values now are between 0 and 1, and we can uh, get from this image uh, um, a mask with Boolean values. So we'll first start by doing this computation. We'll subtract from the, the red channel, which is layer 0. We'll subtract the green channel, which is layer 1. And we add to that uh, uh, the value we get by subtracting from the, the red channel, the blue channel. So if these two values are positive, this means that there is more red than green and more red than blue. Uh, and now we check which of these, this is now a matrix that has the same height and width as the, the image, because we are using NumPy when, and we are doing these operations on the whole matrix. And now we can check which of these values is above, say, 1.2. This, this, uh, I did some trial and error to, to get the, to fine tune the value, but this was the value that gives the, the result I'm going to show. So this red mask is a matrix with Boolean values, 0 and 1, uh, with uh, uh, false and true, that has a true value for all the pixels where this, this uh, is greater than 1.2. So there is more red than green or blue. So now we're going to get these pixels from our image. We use this red mask, and so these red pixels now are tuples of three values and correspond only to the pixels that are red in the image. And for this, we're going to copy the blue channel. We're going to copy the red channel uh, into the blue here. So the red pixels, all the pixels, uh, layer 2, is the blue value for all these pixels uh, where we found the red color in the image. So we're going to copy there the value that was in the red. We're going to copy red to blue, and then we're going to put the blue original blue value into the red. So what we're doing is we're exchanging the blue channel with the red channel on all the red pixels, but not the other. And now we put everything back into the image in the same position, and we save the image. So now we have this image here. So we identify the red pixels, and we shift it into blue. We can do the same thing for green. So instead of using the blue channel, we now exchange red with green, and we get this image. But this, we see that the green is too, too bright, and this is not quite the color that we want, but it's also easy to adjust. So, for example, instead of merely copying the red values to the green channel, 
we can copy it to the green channel but divide by two. So we get less saturation and now we have a, a more reasonable green. So this way you can easily manipulate the image, the colors, the contrast and so forth. Okay? So this is just a simple example. Uh, the basic idea is that the images get loaded into these NumPy matrices and then you just need to do the operations on the, on the values to get the result you want. Uh, so let's see a, a more uh, sophisticated example. This is a, um, a, a microscopy photograph from, from uh, uh, plant tissue. We have uh, different cells here. You can see the, the faint outline. And the idea was to uh, automate measuring the dimensions of the cells and shapes and so forth. Uh, so this is useful because taking the photograph is not uh, that difficult, but then doing everything by hand, examining all the cells, uh, that can take a long time. So we, uh, once again, we use psychic image, but we have here some uh, additional methods. Uh, psychic image is a, a, is a library with lots of, of functions for processing images. For example, uh, there, there is this method for denoising by, by uh, looking at each point in the neighborhood and trying to average. It uses a weighted average with, with a Gaussian uh, function that uh, eliminates those, those noise, those pixels uh, that occur uh, uh, isolated. So we have uh, the image in a TIFF file. We read the image and we read it as a grayscale image. So in this case, this matrix uh, has only one layer. It doesn't have three layers, so it's just a bidimensional matrix. We can invert the image. So uh, since we use this image as floats, we have everything between zero and one. If, you sub if we subtract it from one, then black becomes white and, and so on. We invert uh, all the, the the color there. Uh, and we're going to use this um, uh, denoising. We have the, the, the weight of the, the sigma function, the, um, sorry, the, the Gaussian function that we're using for denoising, the, the width of, the, of the, this function and so on. You can fine tune these parameters to remove noise. And we're go also going to remove these 70 pixels around the image. This is because there is some, some distortion uh, on the edges, so this is the, the central part is, is the best one, and there's also these, these dark uh, parts here. So we get this result. We, we flip the image, we uh, remove some noise, and we inverted the, the color. So we have the, the cell membranes, are, or the cell walls, are now in black, and the, uh, the rest is white. <coughs> now we can uh, rescale the intensity. So this is very faint and we can try to rescale everything so that the, the dark parts become real uh, black and the, the white parts uh, are whiter. In this case, we're going to compute these 10 and 90 percent percentiles from the, the brightness values on the image, and we're going to rescale everything uh, to those values. So basically, we are clipping all, everything that is below 10 percent, all of those counts as black, and everything that is above the 90 percentile is white, and we are stretching the contrast. So this becomes uh, uh, a bit heavier, but now it's easier to see the, the cell walls, and we can use this uh, threshold by uh, determining a threshold value to separate black from white. So we get rid of the grays, and we just separate what is uh, the central part of each cell in this case. So this is an adaptive threshold that uses this uh, a square of 100 pixels. It computes the average in each, uh, in each uh, square. And we have this offset of zero, which means that we are actually using the average to separate between black and white. This is useful because you can see that the brightness, the overall brightness of the image changes from one region to the other. So if we use the same threshold overall, we don't get very good results because it's too dark for one part or too bright for the other. The adaptive threshold will scan uh, in this uh, 100 pixels window and use the average for that local part of the image. So it can adapt to this uh, different uh, brightness. And now we can uh, do this uh, to get these uh, better blobs we can do this trick, which is uh, erosion following, uh, followed by dilation. So erosion will uh, look at the white pixels and remove uh, the edge of any area of white pixels. So if you do an erosion with a disk of three pixels inside, 
everything that is smaller than three pixels will disappear, will uh, be gone. So those, those white blotches that are too small will disappear. Those that are not will still retain some pixels. And so when we go back using dilation, they will go back to the original size. So this is one way of, of removing small specks from the image. And basically what we get as a result are these blobs that correspond to the central part of the, of the cell. Now we can do segmentation using, for example, this watershed algorithm. The, this is called watershed because it works as if the image was a landscape. So you can imagine that the, the brightness values here uh, define the hills and, and valleys. And we start from these core regions and we start filling the basins with water. And the frontier is drawn where the water levels touch, where the water touches when the levels rise. So where the, the level is the same uh, in those areas. So basically, if we can think of, of the original image as giving us ridges where this is bright, or where the, the cell uh, walls are, and if we fill the cells with water, we get these uh, frontiers some of them are not very good because we cannot see very well the, the cell wall, but many of them correspond to the actual cells because this is where the, the watershed algorithm finds the frontier between different regions. And we here, uh, so we are going to do this with the, the reverse of the image. This depends on whether you have a white background or a black uh, background uh, and so on, but depending on the image, you may have to adjust that. Uh, and we're going to get all these. Uh, uh, regions labels. Now we can do things, for example, like uh, uh, so this labels matrix gives us the label value for each pixel, so the region it corresponds to. We can get all the labels uh, that have pixels on the edges because these are regions that are being cut by the edge of the photograph, and we can extract those. So we, we retain only the regions that are not cut by the edge of the image, and now we can uh, extract information for, from the size of each image, the shape, and so on, and we can use this also to filter out, for example, regions like this, which cannot be just a single cell because they are too large, or very tiny regions that are a fragment of a cell because they are too small, and we get a sample of the cells to, to process. So this is just a, a basic idea of how you can process images. The, the, the important parts here are that you have all these algorithms in scikit image for uh, segmentation, for denoising, for thresholding, and so on. So if you need to do this kind of work, look up the documentation on scikit image, and you have lots of, of methods implemented for that. Another common uh, problem is to use uh, a web service for doing some computation, but not the same thing as crawling a website, because that is for when the information is on a site that is not very friendly for using with, with a computer. Sometimes you have services that are actually built for automation, uh, and so uh, one example of that is the, this BLAST server at NCBI. BLAST is a, a, a sequence search algorithm that you can give a sequence for a gene or a protein and you get results. So uh, you can access this from uh, the, the web page or you can use uh, this, uh, um, uh, you can just submit the, uh, the query automatically. So basically you have to submit a query, you have this uh, URL here that uh, you can, uh, in this case, you are querying for similar sequences to a known protein, so you just can give the, the identifier here, and uh, uh, you can give the different options for, for the BLAST program. And what happens is that you get a, a, a page, so if you do this online, you will see uh, a web page telling you your, your request is being processed, but inside that web page, hidden from users, there is this tag here, plus info begin, which has uh, the ID of the request and an, expect, an estimate of how long it will take to, to process it. So this is, this is built into the page to uh, help with, to facilitate automation. So if you're a user, you are looking at what is visible in the page. If you're using a, 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 your script to get the result, you will look for this record inside the page and uh, you can use this request ID to ask 
for uh, whether or not your, your job is already completed and to get the results. So if you, the results are not ready, you get the status of waiting. If the results are ready, then you get the status of ready and you, get, and you can retrieve the results. So we can automate this by, uh, we have this start, uh, starting um, uh, URL here. This is the base URL. In this uh, example, I'm going to use the request uh, uh, module. So that URL lib that, that we saw is a very basic uh, module for just getting data from, from the site. This request uh, module is, is a bit more sophisticated and makes it easier to do uh, things that are more, uh, more demanding, such as, as putting more uh, those, those parameters into the URL and so forth. So for example, when, when you have this get function, you can specify the different parameters that you want to include in your request, and uh, uh, they will get automatically put into the URL in the, uh, in the proper format you just need to provide them as a dictionary of the keys and values that you want to put in. So this function will generate the, this kind of, of notation for the URL where each command has an equal, then the value, and then this, this uh, and sign, and so forth. So this way we can query by using a, a, a Uniprot identifier. So this is the, the sequence we are going to use to query the database. Uh, and this would be the, the code for doing that. We, we specify all the parameters for the query, and we get the data from the URL, and we return the text uh, from the page. Now, from this text, we're going to, uh, if you, you were a user using the page, you'll actually see a page telling you that your, your request was being processed. But what we want is to look inside the, the code of the page and find this record here that gives us this information. So this is what we can extract in this uh, uh, function. From the HTML code, we're going to look for kubelastinfo begin and then uh, split between these two tags, so between the begin and end of the info. And now we get the request ID and the time uh, expected for the request to be, to be ready. Uh, so now w we can look at the, the final function. Basically, we, get, uh, we are waiting for the results. Uh, we can print out how many seconds it takes uh, uh, to wait. This time sleep is a useful uh, function. You can use the time module because you can tell Python to pause your program for, for uh, a number of seconds. So it's useful in this case because you should not be asking the, the server for your results if they are not ready yet. So we, uh, uh, we determine how long we have to wait for the results. We wait for that number of seconds and then we check, uh, for, uh, we check the results. So we go for the URL, we send in our request ID and we check if uh, it's ready or if it's still waiting. So if the status we get is waiting, then we wait for another 12 seconds uh, and we keep waiting until it's ready. When it's ready, then we return the result as a text. So now we can use this, uh, this code and basically we get the result in this text format in this way. Uh, and now we can parse that and just extract the, the uh, parts that we want. So basically we want the, the expected value and the, the score in bits and also the identifier of the, the homologous sequences that we found, and we can extract everything into uh, a, a file for the output. So basically, this would be the, the code we have. We uh, start the query, we get the, the, the ID and the, the estimate of how long it will take. Then we call this function that gets the result that just waits until everything is done and then uh, gives us the result. And then we call this function to save the result. So this basically parses this uh, file or this text string that we get from the server and parses this to output to a, a, a neat table where we have uh, just information that we want. So this is an example of how you can use uh, this kind of services to, especially if you need to do this many times and you don't have to be waiting by 
your browser for whatever time it takes to compute. So you just leave your, your script running and then you go get the result. <coughs> so just one, uh, one final example to, to uh, illustrate one different problem, which is uh, sometimes you need to get data from files that have different formats. So in this case, these are sound uh, files. They have uh, information on the, the time, frequency, and amplitude for, for the sound, uh, but they have different uh, formats. There are these uh, partial formats that have uh, the, the time, frequency, and amplitude in, uh, row, in uh, lines here. Then there are these uh, frame formats that have, have frames for different, for different types. The, the information there is basically the same, but it's stored in slightly uh, different ways. So one, one way of doing this, so if you have different file formats, and, uh, but they all have the same information, you can think of your program as working in two abstraction levels. One deals with each type of file and stores everything in the same format. And then on top of that, uh, you don't care about the file where the data came from, but the data is always in the same format, so you just process the data. So this is, I'm not going to go into much details on the actual values and so on, but uh, uh, the idea is that we get a function to read these uh, partial, uh, uh, partial format file, and we read each line, we check uh, the, the split here between the, the different values, how many values we have, and we create uh, a matrix which has the, the time in the first column, the frequency in the second, and the amplitude of the sound for each uh, time uh, in the sample. The other format, the frame format, is slightly different, so we read it in a slightly different way, but the, the output is the same. We also have a matrix with time, frequency, and amplitude. Now, what we can do is that each of these uh, functions does not receive the file name, it receives the uh, list of strings with the data in the file. And the reason for this is that we create this additional function that reads the file, it receives the file name and reads the file, and checks which format the file is. So, if the first line starts with this partial format, then this is a partial file. If it starts with the frame format, then it's this other one, the, the frame file. And it calls the different functions depending on the first line. So the reason for doing this is that now we have this function read file that we can give it the name of one of these files and we don't need to care which type of file it is because it will identify the type of file, call the right function and always output the same result which is a matrix with the, the time, frequency and amplitude. So now we can go from this to the rest of our program by ignoring that detail of having different file formats. And if we have someday another file format where this can be in, we just add here the, the different file format and the rest of the program will work all the same. So this is a, an important general principle that you try to break things down into different, uh, different problems the program is trying to solve in a way that you can isolate parts of your program from problems that those parts have nothing to do with. So now let's see what we can do. We can, uh, uh, we receive uh, an inf uh, uh, the file for inputting, the reading the time, frequency and amplitude, and we get, uh, we want the file where we want to export the plot, and we can just read the data, and then plot uh, frequency versus time, for example. So this is the time uh, of our sample, and this is how the frequency changed in the sound over time. But we are missing information here because we, for each time and frequency pair, we, we also have an amplitude that determines how intense the sound was uh, at that frequency. So we can represent different amplitudes with colors. We're going to use this uh, color map that gives us a range of, uh, so it basically works like a, a third axis where the minimum value that we are going to associate to plot here will go into the first color of the color map, the maximum to the last, and it represents everything in between uh, w using the range of colors. This hot color map goes from black to, to, in to white, passing from red, orange, and so on, as, as if uh, things were heating up. 
and we can plot the, the intensity as the colors here. There is still one small problem, which is when uh, points are overlapping, uh, we, we don't see very well uh, how intense they are. So we can uh, use uh, a Gaussian kernel, uh, using kernel density estimation like we saw uh, for one dimension in the, in the distribution of, of magnitudes for the stars, for example. But we can do this in two dimensions. So basically we have this two-dimensional Gaussian where we, we have one point with some amplitude. This gives us a Gaussian curve with a given height and we add up all those Gaussian curves. So we, we have this grid where we're going to add the Gaussian values and we're going to do this for, uh, to create a matrix with the sum of all the, the contributions. So each uh, time frequency pair has one altitude that corresponds to the amplitude. This contributes a Gaussian curve with some size and as we add everything together all those things where there are uh, more intensity values then we get higher peaks of the Gaussian curve and the rest get lower. So this is to compute one Gaussian for the grid. Here uh, we can uh, compute this for the, the whole grid by adding all the Gaussian contributions of all the points. Uh, and this is basically just to just an auxiliary function to get us the minimum and maximum values and build uh, an axis that has this small margin. So we go from the minimum minus 5% of the, the complete range up to the maximum plus 5%. This is just so we can get uh, the axis to be slightly larger than the, the value range that we have. So skipping a bit the details here, basically we load the, uh, the file, uh, we set up the, the uh, image here, we're going to use this tile with dark black, uh, background, we load the file, we uh, uh, get this uh, um, array for the, the, uh, the values of the, um, the standard deviation that we're going to use, but since we are using a two-dimensional Gaussian, we can calibrate the standard deviation in the x-axis and the y-axis. This is necessary because if you see the, the scale of the frequency values is very different from the scale of time. So if we use the same sigma values for the Gaussians, they would be very distorted because this scale is much larger than the other one. So this is basically a, a set of sigma values for the two directions. We create this mesh grid for, uh, this is uh, necessary for three-dimensional plots. If you are using a two-dimensional plot, you need an X value and then a, a vector of X values and a vector of Y values. If you are creating a three-dimensional plot, you need a matrix of X values. So the X values are repeated in, in columns and you need a matrix of Y values repeated in rows and, uh, and then a matrix of the Z values. This is so that for each, for each location on these matrices, the, the plotting function can figure out what is the Z, the X, and the Y uh, for all of those points. Uh, fortunately, if you want to create just a regular grid, you have this mesh grid function that receives the two vectors for X and Y and outputs the two matrices by repeating the columns and the rows uh, uh, correspondingly. So this would be the matrices for, for using the, the plane, the x y plane. We get the, the power value, which is the z value, by uh, computing for all these combinations of x and y uh, the sum of all these Gaussians defined by these sigma uh, values with the data. Uh, and now this gives us just a, an array of all the values. We can reshape it to fit it in the, the matrix again. So this, uh, this is something that you're probably going to use a lot, which is, uh, I have an example here. Okay. So when uh, you're doing something, you can uh, uh, do, uh, create a matrix that is just uh, one single column. In this case, we have uh, as many uh, values as we have in these matrices, but we have everything in a row. Uh, so we are computing each one individually. But now we want to fit it back into the shape of the matrix, so you can do reshape. There are these two functions, flatten will uh, give you the values on a matrix as a single vector, so all in a row, and reshape can put it back into uh, the shape that you want. 
if you if you go from always the same shape flat and, and go back to the same shape you guarantee that the order is preserved if you change the shape to a different shape then maybe things won't work but this is useful when you need to deal with the values in a matrix as a, a single vector so now we can we can do uh, if we want to do the field we can use this contour f function that fills the the color o o otherwise we just do the the contour and we get we can get this data so in this case i'm reading this file tone file i don't want to fill in i have these six levels for for the contours so these are the the contour levels that we're going to use here and these are the the sigma values for the gaussian so 0 0.01 on time and 5 on frequency because the, the scale of the frequency is larger but still we can see that the, they are a bit wider on the frequency than on time uh, we can also change a bit so 0 0.1 for example to to, get, to widen them on time and make things smoother so this basically is adding a larger wider gaussian and so we are losing this kind of uh, these edges here uh, and now we can do this with, with contours and we can, we can, for example, if we use the same sigma for both scales, we get these flattened images because this scale is much larger than the time scale. So basically we can uh, calibrate things and now we're representing the, the sound intensity for our sample along the time by adding all the contributions of all the different points that we have. So this you can generalize for any kind of data where you have basically these three dimensions. You have an X and a Y and then an intensity value of some sort, like you're, you're counting insects in different regions or, or something like that. So you can use kernel density estimation to smoothen that and then use this kind of plot to, to represent it. <coughs> so to sum up, uh, the, the idea of this lecture was to um, since we're finishing the course now and the, the the most important goal of this course is to give you a starting point for from which you can proceed and uh, and learn what you need to solve your problems so this is basically to show you different directions these are specific uh, uh, problems probably it's unlikely that you're you're going to need all of these or even a, a part of these but it, uh, I wanted to give you the idea that you have these tools and it's not not difficult to, to solve these kinds of problems as long as you know that you have the tools and you just look up the documentation and use them. Okay? So this is the important part, that you that you learn what you can do. Because then if you know that you can do it, it's easy to, to find out how to do it. Okay. 